Right, the title of the sermon this evening is 1 John 5, 7, Defended. 1 John 5, 7, Defended. And the uh, subtitle is the Kama Johannium. So I'm going to explain that, uh, explain that to you in, in just a minute. If you're not familiar with what that statement is, the Kama Johannium. But let me begin with uh, opening remarks, just, just reiterating a, a very familiar point. I'm sure you can consider this as, as a reminder if you'd like. But our church here, Valley Baptist Church, is fervently... Fervently, King James only. We are King James only. We believe that the King James Bible is God's preserved, perfect word. It is inerrant. It, we believe that what the, exactly what all the prophets wrote, the holy men of God that spake, it was written down. I believe it has been preserved throughout time. I believe we have just that in the English Bible. If someone approached me and they said, hey, you're the pastor of Valley Baptist Church. As the pastor of your church, tell me the most important doctrine. I would say the King James Bible. Amen. Believing Amen. that the King James Bible is the word of God. You know why? Because you have no other doctrine if, you, if your Bible is corrupt. Right. All of these right. other things you can't trust. You don't know what's right. You don't know what's wrong. You have no foundation to base anything that you believe upon. Amen. The word of God is where everything derives from. The word of God is the most important thing. And someone may look at the sermon that I'm about to preach tonight and say, why are you preaching on, you know, uh, why are you preaching defending the word of God with just eight verses or eight words removed? You know, basically it's not even a full verse, some people would say. Why would you dedicate an entire sermon to that? You must not, my friend, understand the importance of God's word. That's what that tells me. You don't truly understand the importance of God's word. Now, there are a lot of people that will attack you know, the Bible nowadays, aren't they? And most of them come under the guise of being a scholar, you know, being a paleographer, a paleographist, being a, 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 what is it called, a, philo a philologist, a philologist. And, you know, there are so many different subjects that, that cross over textual criticism, like people like uh, James White, and, 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 of course, he's probably the most uh, renowned to us, at least. Uh, infamous would be a better word for him. You know, but because of his stance against the King James Bible, but... Let me say this, the majority the main, of mainstream Christianity, mainstream Christianity today rejects, they reject, and they say that the majority of the verse, 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7, does not belong in your Bible. They would look at 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7, and they would say that the majority of what you have in your King James Bible is not the word of God, that you have man's words written down there. Now, I'm going to prove that to be wrong. I'm going to prove that to be a lie. From first, the Bible. That's our authority. Cross-referencing scripture with scripture. We're going to see the support of what's taught here elsewhere. But then also, I'm going to, I'm going to refer to historical evidence. Two different subjects under historical evidence to prove to you, without a shadow of a doubt, that the first John chapter number 5, verse number 7, is meant to be in your Bible. Now, first, I want to give you a list. Of, of verses that are removed from modern Bible versions. I want you to understand this, uh, the, the extent of this. Verses that are removed from model, modern Bible versions today. I'm using the NIV as an example because it is the, the forerunner of, to all of these, the most popular version. Matthew chapter number 12, 12 verse number 47 is removed and, and, and it's put in the footnotes. Matthew 17, 21, completely removed. Matthew 18, 11, completely removed. Matthew 21, 44, removed and put in the footnotes. Matthew 23, 14, completely removed. Matthew 7, Mark, I'm sorry, Mark 7, 16, completely removed. Mark 9, 44, completely removed. Mark 9, 46, completely removed. Mark 11, 26, completely removed. Mark 15, 28, completely removed. You may or may not be aware of this. This is, this is crazy. That, that I, 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 this surprises me even to the extent of all of the other people that are that, that are the scholars of the, the day. Of, of course, their basis it would make sense. But Mark 16, Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 20. So all 12 verses completely removed. Luke 17, 36, completely removed. Luke 22, 44, removed and put in the footnotes. Luke 22, 43, removed in the footnotes. Luke 23, 17, completely removed. John 5, 4, completely removed. John 7, 53, and then, and then uh, through 8, chapter 8, verse 11, removed in the footnotes. Acts 8, 37, completely removed. Acts 15, 34, completely removed. Acts 24, 7, completely removed. Acts 28, 29, completely removed. Romans 16, 24, completely removed. 
First John chapter number five, verse number seven says this in the NIV. For there are three that testify. For there are three that testify. The NLT, that's the New Living Translation, reads, so we have these three witnesses. <clears throat> the NRSB, that is the New Revised Standard Version, says there are three that testify. The New English Translation says, for there are three that testify. The New American Standard Bible says, for there are three that testify. The Good News Translation says, there are three witnesses. The English Standard Version says, for there are three that testify, and the Amplified Bible says, for there are three witnesses. Look down at your Bible, the real Bible, 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, and look at what the Bible says. It reads, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That's what the Bible should say. I believe that the Bible is perfect. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter number 2, verse number 17, all the way back to the time of Paul, Paul writing, he says this, For we are not as many, as many, which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. So even all the way back to the time of Paul, he says that many people are corrupting the Word of God. Well, nothing has changed today. Nothing's different today. People are still attacking the Word of God. People are still corrupting the Word of God. They're trying to change the Word of God. I'm going to read to you from Got Questions, give you an introduction if you're not familiar with what the Kama Yohanian is. This is from a mainstream site. They, they lean more towards uh, you know, a reformed type of theology, but it's very mainstream. It's one of the most popular Christian websites that you can go to if you type in a Bible question. This is this comes up very often as far as in the search results. This will give you an idea of what the Kama Yohanium is. So that's actually the question. What is the Kama Yohanium? 1 John 5, 7 through 8. Answer. The Kama Yohanium, also known as Kama Yohanin, is a textual variant in regards to 1 John 5, 7 through 8. The word Kama simply means short clause. And Yohanium means pertaining to John. So John's Kama is what it's saying. Without the comma, 1 John 5, 7, 8 reads, For there are three that testify, so that would be from verse 7, right? Claiming it from verse 7. And then notice this. This is from verse 8. Look down in your Bible. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And the three are in agreement. So basically what they do is they drop the end of verse 7 totally, and they drop the beginning of verse 8 completely. That's what they say the comma Yohanium is. That's what's considered the comma Yohanium, that clause right there. So they totally drop the end of verse 7, totally drop the beginning of verse 8, and they smash that together, right? And they make that, they try to make that one you know, thought, one you know, continuous thought, right? It says this, <clears throat> to continue with the comma, 1 John 5, 7 through 8 reads, and they quote from the King James Bible, There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. If the Kama Yohanian was originally part of 1 John 5, 7 through 8, it would be the clearest and most direct reference to the Trinity in the entire Bible. However, it is highly unlikely that the Kama Yohanian was originally a part of 1 John. None of the oldest Greek manuscripts of 1 John contain the Kama, and none of the very early church fathers include it. When quoting or referencing 1 John 5, 7 to 8, the presence of the Kama Yohanian in Greek manuscripts is actually quite rare until the 15th century AD. It is primarily found in Latin manuscripts. While some of the Latin manuscripts containing the Kama Yohanian are ancient, the Kama Yohanian did not appear in the original Latin Vulgate written by Jerome. In the 16th century, when Decidurus Erasmus was compiling what became known as the Texas Receptus, he did not include the Kama Yohanian in the first or second editions. Due to intense pressure from the Catholic Church and others who wanted it included because of its support for Trinitarianism, Erasmus included the Kama Yohanian in later editions of the Texas Receptus. He's obviously putting his twist on why he believes all this happened, of course. Erasmus included the Kama Yohanim in the later editions of the Texas Receptus. His decision resulted in the Kama Yohanim being included in the King James Version of the Bible, and later in the New King James Version. None of the modern Greek texts, UBS 4, Nestle, Allen 27, majority texts, contain the Kama Yohanim. 
they, these are they, when they say Greek text, they're talking about the people that looked at all the manuscripts, culminated them, and then put them into something that would be of like the Texas Receptus. They're not talking about manuscripts themselves. They're talking about the Greek texts that were created. That's what USB or I'm sorry, uh, UBS and uh, uh, Nestle Allen. These are these are Greek texts that are that are uh, culminated and put together. And they say this is what we think the closest to the original said because they don't believe they can get it perfect, right? And then they translate from that into English. That's what they mean by Greek text, just to make sure nobody misunderstood that. And then it says this. Um, while it would be convenient for there to be an explicit statement confirming the Trinity in the Bible, it is highly unlikely that the Kama Yohannium was originally a part of 1 John. Some ancient scribe either intentionally or accidentally added it to a Latin manuscript. And then that edition was copied thousands upon thousands of times. You know what he's meant? You know what he's Admitting there without telling you? Thousands upon thousands of times. He's talking about it being in thousands of different locations. We'll get to that in just a moment. But it's copied thousands and thousands of times. It's found thousands of times all throughout manuscript. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. We'll get to the, the historic aspect of that in just a moment. This eventually resulted in the Kami Ohanim appearing in the vast majority. Well, he does make it. Latin manuscripts. Whatever the scribe's motives, it is absolutely wrong to add to God's words. While what the Kami Ohanim says is true... It is not a God-breathed statement. It does not belong in the Bible. You notice that? Yes, he, he makes no bones about it, does he? It is not a God-breathed statement and does not belong in the Bible. That is absolute blasphemy. Blasphemy. Then he says this. The doctrine of the Trinity is taught and implied in many other biblical passages. If God thought an explicit mention of the Trinity was necessary, he himself would have made sure... It was in his word. He also admits there, of course, this guy believes in like the Catholic Orthodox Trinity. He says this, if God thought an explicit mention of the Trinity was necessary, he himself would have made sure it was in his word. What's he saying? There is no explicit mention of the Orthodox Trinity in all of the Bible. So he also admits that, shoots himself in the foot there as well. I want you to get your Bibles and turn to Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 6. So the Kama Yohanian that just means the short clause or the short phrase of John. It's referring to that phrase there found in verse 7 and then at, at the end of verse 7, the beginning of verse 8. The end of verse 7 and the beginning of verse 8. Now I'm going to be focusing on verse 7 tonight. I'm going to be focusing on that tonight. But we believe in the preservation of God's word. This is a doctrine that is taught throughout the Bible. I believe that God, once his word was written down, kept his word. That he divinely inspired his word, the words that the prophet spoke and wrote down, and that he divinely preserved his word through his power, through God's power and God's strength. It was not relied upon man to preserve his word. You know, I don't believe that you know, all of this, all of the, you know, man's words that just crept into the Bible repeatedly over and over again to where now today we can't even find God's word. Because if you were to set this person aside, all of these people that believe this mainstream view, they don't believe that God's word is purely anywhere on this earth today. No, they don't believe that it exists. They believe that it's gone, that, that it's, it's, it's been fragmented and, and fallen apart in the original manuscripts. It was maybe copied for a few generations, and it doesn't exist. We don't believe that. I believe that God's word has been preserved, and I believe that it will forever be. Amen. Amen. From what is written down till today for forevermore. Here now, I want you, like I said, to turn to Psalm chapter 12, verse number 6. I'm going to read to you from Isaiah chapter number 59. Isaiah chapter number 59 reads, verse number 21, As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed, and then he says this, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. That's powerful. Right. He said, the words that I put in your mouth, Isaiah, the words that you're speaking today, right now, those words are not going to depart out of your seed's mouth. Neither out of your seed's seed mouth. And then he says this, from henceforth, from right now, and forever. Man. That means for every single generation, doesn't it? Every generation will have God's word. It was right. never gone. It's never been gone. It's always existed. God promised to preserve his word. Man. Look at Psalm chapter number 12, verse number 6. The Bible says this, The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. Look at verse 7. 
Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. So he's talking to God, saying God's going to keep them. What are we talking about? His words, right? That's what them is referring back to. It's a pronoun referring back to the word. So if God is going to keep the word. Thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. That's exactly what he told Isaiah, wasn't it? It's exactly what he said. He said, in your, in your mouth, in your seed's mouth, in your seed's seed's mouth, from henceforth say it forever. Say it, Lord, forever. Forever. We'll always have access to God's word. There'll never be a time when someone can't get the word of God. Amen. I want you, now I want to turn to one other passage, Matthew chapter number 4, verse number 4. It's also about the preservation of God's word, but I love this verse because it's very specific. Because people like, well, claim, you know, I believe in the preservation of God's word, when they really don't believe in the preservation of God's word. Notice when we read in Psalm chapter 12, he said, first, the words of the Lord are pure words. They're pure words. It says, silver tried in the furnace of earth, purified seven times. So what are God's words? Pure words. Then he said, thou shalt keep them. So what do they keep? What is, what is God keeping? His words, but his pure words. Isn't he? He's saying his perfect words, his pure words. Not just part of it. That means all of it, right? <laughs> thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them. That's pure words. From, from you know, to this generation forever. So forever, we're always going to have God's word. Look at Matthew chapter number 4. This is when the Jesus is being tempted. Look at Matthew chapter number 4. I want you to look at... Uh, we'll read verses 1 through 4. It says this. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was, at, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Verse 4. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Notice that. Man lives by not only bread alone, he said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word, excuse me, every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Not just some of the words. Not just what you know God kept until that point. That means that I if I if I'm gonna live by God's word, and Jesus commanded repeatedly, he made that statement talking about living by God's word, right? He made that statement repeatedly. If we're going to live by God's word, God expects us to keep his commandments and to do the things that he's commanded us and, and what he wants us to do. Do you know what you need? Every word. Amen. Every last one of them. The Amen. pure words. You need every single word. So don't tell me, oh, it's just the end of 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. It's just the beginning of verse number 8. It's not that big of a deal. It's not even the whole verse. Every word matters. Don't try right. to give me that crap. Amen. That's garbage. Every single word matters. All of it matters. All of the Bible matters. I don't want you touching a single word in my Bible. You stay away from my Bible, James Amen. White. Amen. Get away from my Bible. You change your own Bible. Don't touch my Bible. I want every word. And if God has for me, God put those words in there for me. He divinely inspired those words, and he preserved those words for you and for me to sit down and read. And you know what Jesus said? You're, if you're going to live by God, you're going to live by every word. Not, not just by bread alone, but by every word of God. Every single one, every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God, every single word matters. Amen. I want you to go back to 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. First, we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. And we're going to look at the consistency of what's taught here in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. Here in 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7, with the rest of the Bible. And I want to show you how we find so many times how you learn more by comparing Scripture with Scripture. And that if you didn't have verse number 7 here, there would be a lot of things that you wouldn't be able to fully understand. And by having verse number 7, it enlightens you much more on a teaching in the Bible. It enlightens you much more. And I agree, the Trinity is taught by verse number 7. Very clearly, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. That is the Trinity, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. That's the true Trinity being taught there. Now, I want you right now to get your hand over in John chapter number 1, verse number 1. John chapter number 1, verse number 1. We're going to compare Scripture with Scripture and see the consistency of what's found here in 1 John chapter number 5 with the rest of the Bible. But again, we're going to begin at the simpler text first. First, we see here in John chapter number 1, verse number 1, one of the most famous verses in the entire Bible. It says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was 
God. So first we see that the Word is with God. There's the distinction that's drawn between God and the Word and His Word, right? And then we see after that, it tells you, and the Word was God. What does it say? In this case, it's not talking about the Holy Spirit, of course. It's talking about just the Word of God. It's saying that these two that it's speaking of are one, isn't it? Same concept that we find in 1 John 5, 7, isn't it? And then it says this in verse number 2, the same was in the beginning with God. What is it doing there? It's further drawing that distinction, isn't it? Well, if you compare John chapter number 1 to the very beginning, go back to 1 John chapter number 1, you'll see here that it says this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled, and then it says, of the word of life. Notice that this is almost identical to what we read in John chapter 1, verse number 1, isn't it? Look at verse number 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life. Watch this, though. Which was with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So if you compare John chapter number 1 to 1 John chapter number 1, what's used interchangeably there? It says that in, in John chapter number 1, that, that it was God and his word, right? Well, 1 John 1, what does it say? says the Father and His Word. What do we have in 1 John chapter number 5? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Do you know what John chapter number 1 is saying? The Father and the Word, and these two are one. It's not referring to, of course, the Holy Spirit, but it's teaching the same exact concept that we find elsewhere in the Bible. So we see perfect, perfect consistency with these two passages. Also, I want you to go to John chapter number 10, verse number 30. John chapter number 10, verse number 30. Of course, we know in John chapter number 1, we're told later on in that chapter that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father. And then it says, full of grace and truth. What is it saying? If he's begotten, He's what? He's a son. I know a lot of people have trouble understanding that, but that's what that's saying. He's the Son of God, right? Amen. So the Son of God is referring to as the Word. But what did it tell us? That the Father and the Word, that they're one, right? That's what we saw there in, in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. Well, the Son is the Word made flesh, right. right? Well, look at John chapter number 10, and I want you to look at verse number uh, 27. We'll begin reading there. It says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Look at verse 30. I and my Father are one. You know what you have here? The Word made flesh, saying, I and my Father are one. Right? What do we see? These three are one, found in 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. It's almost the exact same wording even here. I and my Father are one. So we see the perfect consistency with these couple of passages here in Scripture, right? Notice that they're all found in the same location, too. I want you to keep that in your mind. As far as, or the, in, in the same location of the same books written by the same authors. So we keep finding these cross-references where? Within the books of the same exact author, right? You know, the Bible, when you, when you read, very often you'll notice that there are, that certain revelations are given to certain authors. And they will write about the same topics very often. Not only that, about the Word in John chapter 1, you find him writing about the Word in Revelation chapter number 19. He talks about you know, when, when uh, Jesus is coming back. It says that, that he, he call, it refers to him as the Word of God, doesn't it? So we see this. We see this pattern throughout Scripture. So it makes perfect sense that if we were to find this statement about, you know, the three being one, or I and my Father are one, the Word being with God and being God, where would we find it? In John's writings, wouldn't it? Doesn't it make perfect sense? Go back to John chapter number 5. Now, this is the strongest. This is by far the strongest parallel that we looked at yet. But we see already a strong parallel there with 1 John 5 and, and John 1 and John 10. So try, if you've got a bulletin there, go ahead and put that in 1 John 5. But that being our main text, we're going to continually be coming back to that. I want you to go to John chapter number 5. John chapter number 5. This is the scriptural support proving... You know, further, that the King James Bible is perfect, that this should be in your Bible, and you learn from 1 John 5, 7. We learn from it. Look at John chapter number 5. I want you to look at uh, verse number 31. It says this, If I bear witness of myself, 
My witness is not true. Verse 32. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Now, I want to stop there for a moment. We're going to read those verses one more time. We're going to come back to John 5, but I want to cross-reference these two just for a moment. It says this again. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Then he says this. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. I want you to turn over to, you already have a bulletin, or should, in 1 John 5. I want you to turn over to John chapter number 19. John chapter number 19. I want you to look at verse number 34. It says this. Verse, we'll read verse 32 first. Then came the soldiers and brake the legs of the first, and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they brake not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and it says, And forthwith came there out blood and water. And he, verse 35, And he that saw it bare record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that he might believe. Okay? Well, what did Jesus say a moment ago? He said that there's another that bears record of me, and I know that his record is true. Right? We see here that there is one that's bearing record of what? The water and the blood that came out of his side. It tells you afterwards, and he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. I want you to go over to 1 John chapter number 5 again. 1 John chapter number 5, we'll see what this is talking about. Look at verse number 6. This is he that came by water and blood. Now, does that sound familiar? Of course, well, I went over this and I preached a sermon about it. And you can prove within this chapter and the chapter previous that over and over again, the water and blood is talking about this flesh. What do we see you know, uh, in, in uh, John chapter number 19? We see him being a man, being stabbed in the side of the spear. What's coming out? It's a product of being a human being, right? Water and blood. It's, it's a reference to his flesh and being a man. So again, verse, verse uh, 6. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness. It says, because the Spirit is true. So you can see that cross-reference there. Look at verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. So how many are there that bear record in heaven? Three. There are three that bear record in heaven. Now he's going to tell you who the three are. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then look, and these three are one. I want you to notice that. These three are one. So he tells you there are three that bear record. Who do we see Jesus is referencing here in John chapter number 5 first? Who is he referencing first when he says that there's another that bears record of me and we know that his record is true? Who is it specifically talking about there? It would, have been, it would have been John, definitely, but through what? Through the Holy Spirit. Right, yeah, yeah. If both are true. They're both true, right. Yeah, but it's John, and specifically he's referencing here the Holy Spirit. Okay, well, that's one of the three. I want you to keep looking there in John chapter number 5. And this is going to be the proof text that 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7, should be in your Bible. When you see the depth of this cross-reference, there's no way to look at this and say, this, this shouldn't be in the Bible. When you see how perfectly this fits. And you can learn from it. Look at what it says further. So verse 32 again. There's another that bears witness of me. I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. 1 John chapter 5 verse 6 clearly teaches us that that's speaking of the Spirit. Look at verse 33. He sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. But I received not testimony from man, but these things I say, that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his life. Verse 36. But I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me, pay attention, to finish the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. Verse 37. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. And ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent him, ye believe not. So now what do we have? First we saw the Holy Spirit. That was what was being referenced back in John 19 and 1 John 6, or 1 John 5, 6. Now what do we have? We have the Father bearing record. Now we have two of the three. I want you to look at the next verse. 
Verse number 39. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. You know what we have? We have three bearing records found elsewhere in the Bible. You think that's a coincidence? No. Not a stinking chance. Amen. That's the word of God that belongs there in that text, and you learn from it. That's right. Amen. I want you to go to another passage here. I want you to turn to... I want you to go back to 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7. I'm going to read you here also from John chapter number 5. Uh, after this, verse number uh, 46, it says this. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. And then verse 47. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Notice what he references there. So we see the clear parallel. There's no way out of it. 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7 fits perfectly. Fits like a glove when you compare it. It's literally saying, hey, the Holy Spirit bears record of me. The Father bears record of me. And guess what? The Scriptures bear record of me. You know why? You say, oh, this doesn't matter. Really? Because there's a lot of people that think the word's a person there. There's a lot of people that think 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7 is talking about a person. You know, this tells you just in general that it's very important to compare Scripture with Scripture, that you need more Scripture. If all of what God gave you, if you remove any of it, it'll confuse people. It'll, it'll cause confusion. God puts things in there so you can cross-reference, so you can parallel passages like John 1 and 1 John 1. We find out what? God is talking about the Father. They're, they're used synonymously. He starts talking about the same subjects, making, making the same statements. One time he says Father, one time he says God. We look at 1 John 5, 7. He says there's three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. We see the Word made flesh, and he says, I and my Father are one. We see John chapter number 1, verse number 1, and what does it say? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What's it saying? These two are one. We look at John chapter number 5, and it tells you there's three that are bearing record. Holy Spirit bears record. He's truth, right? The Spirit is truth. Exactly what it says in 1 John 5, 6. Then what's he say? Hey, my Father bears record of me too. Now we have two of the three. And then the third one, he says, search the Scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify to me. You know what you have? The Word bearing record. The literal Word of God. The Word of God written down referring to the Scriptures there, specifically bearing record. Bearing record of the Son of God. So I want you to go back look at 1 John chapter number 5. We're going to read it once more, all of it together there. Verse number 6, it says this, This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood, and it is the Spirit that beareth witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Verse 8, and there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. That's perfect. That's how it's supposed to be. That's how it was originally written down. God has preserved his word. We believe the Bible, the King James Bible, is perfect exactly the way that it is. All right. So now at this point, I'm going to move into the historical evidence. So that was why I have for the evidence coming from Scripture. John chapter number 5. And 1 John chapter 5 is a closed case. Right. That's all I need. I don't need any more evidence than that. That's a closed. They're, they're, it's, it's, too, it's too perfect of a parallel. You know, I'll, I will say this. That's a perfect example is where the Holy Spirit inside of me when I'm reading the Word of God. And, you know, like, uh, like the, the two men that were walking, you know, Caiaphas and the other man. You know, you know Cleopas, I mean, and the other man. Caiaphas. Cleopas and the other man <laughs> that are walking with Jesus. Anybody who knows who Caiaphas is is like, what the world is he saying? <laughs> Cleopas and the other man is walking with Jesus. You know, after, after he disappeared, they realized who he is. He talks about how, how did not our hearts burn within us? I tell you, when I look at cross-references like that, that's exactly how I feel. My heart burns within me. I can see like that is for sure the word of God. Look at how powerful that is. Look at how deep that is. That is too deep for any man. That is too vast for any man. It's too wide for any man. No man can cover that much. No man is that wise where he can sit down and make a book like this. It's not possible. I don't believe that that was added later. Not a chance. No man could do that. Now, that's the proof from the Bible. That, that alone, you know, I believed it already. But even, you know, finding things like that, it just further strengthens my belief in the Word of God. It just further strengthens, you know, my faith that I have in God's Word, that the King James Bible is perfect. Now, first, I'm going to give you the historical evidence. I'm going to tell you what the manuscripts are that exist. Because they, they, that guy and that got questions, 
He tries to intentionally deceive you on what the manuscripts are that exist. And I have looked at this, I can't tell you how many times. This is something that I became extremely interested in. Anyone that knows me knows that I know a lot about this subject. I, I, from the very beginning of when I started serving God at like 20, 21 years old, I really delved into what is the Word of God. You know, I grew up in an independent fundamental Baptist church, and you know, they believed that my whole life my dad believed that the King James Bible is perfect, it's inerrant. And then I just wanted to kind of figure it out for myself at 21. I was already saved, and I just decided, you know, I basically had no foundation. I want to figure out, you know, why they say it's the Word of God. So I looked at every subject. I looked at the manuscript stuff. I've spent a lot of time in it, and I've looked at this stuff a lot. And they always try to exaggerate, which is a lie. They always try to deceive you into thinking that there are no manuscripts that contain this, except Latin manuscripts much, much later. There are manuscripts that, when I'm going to show you this in just a moment, the earliest manuscript, this is very important because people lie about this to you. The earliest manuscript that contains 1 John 5, 7 is actually within the same century of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. It's within the same century, just you know, uh, just like 80 or 70 or so. I can't remember exactly years after that. But I'm going to read over this, but there's another proof that just from a historical uh, perspective, from even a, you know, uh, uh, if you tried to make yourself objective, and hey, I'm going to put on you know, the glasses of the textual critic Bible rejecter, and let's look at it from this other perspective, it's still, you still prove that it should be in, in the Bible. So here I'm going to uh, I'm going to read you. This is the manuscript evidence. So 1 John chapter number five, verse number verse number seven is found in Greek manuscript sixty one, Codex Rabianus and Bright uh, and Britannicus. It's also in the margins of eighty eight and sixty nine manuscript E. So this is this is in seven thirty five A D. And it also has Acts eight thirty seven in that. Likewise, it is found in the old Latin manuscripts Codex. Uh, I don't even know how to pronounce it. It's a super long uh, Latin word. Freisen Genesis, Latin R, Buren 64, AD 500, Leon 1, various readings of 1 John 5, 7 through 8 are in AD 9, or, 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 or in this uh, Leon 1, and it's in this, this uh, text or manuscript is from 913, this is AD, of course, 923, this is New Testament. Leon 2, it's in the margin, and that is from 930 AD. It also has uh, Acts 837 in it. Harl 2, another manuscript from AD 752. Codex uh, Toltanus, Toltanus, 988 AD, and that has Acts 837, um, 9.5, I guess, of Acts, and 9.6. Uh, Codex Demitted uh, Venus, Venus uh, 1150 AD, and it has Acts 837. Codex Colbert, Colbertus. Uh, AD 1150, and then Codex Perpen Perpenaeus, Nanus, Perpenaeus, and that's AD 1250, and it has Acts 837 as well. And this is the important one, Speculum. Speculum, this is Latin M. They'll often give it letters. M, this is in uh, AD 450, and that's within a century of Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. So, uh, Sinaiticus... And Sinaiticus and Vaticanus were around like 3, 360. So it was like 90 years, maybe 370, something like that. 90 to 80 years this manuscript was found with, it has 1 John chapter 5, verse number 7 in it. It's found in 68, this is, this is uh, oftentimes we do it by numbers and letters. So manuscript 68, MG in the margin. 636, it's in the margin. And 918, it's in the margin. It's also found in Omega 110, 429 MG. We go through these fast. I'm sure everybody's not even listening. 221 and 2318, it's in the Mock Fort MS and Codex Wizen Bergens, an 8th century. It is found in the margin of Codex Oda Bonius, Bonius 620, and that's in the 14th century as well. It is also found in Luminous. Uh, manuscript A.D. 850 and Codex Pal Legionis uh, A.D. 650 it is found in German manuscript the Augsburger and that's two Codex 3 A.D. 1350 so it's found in quite a few manuscripts a lot that's just the manuscripts alone it's found in a lot of other places where it's cited and things like that during those same time periods but this is what is the 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 kicker this is the you know uh, the strongest evidence. Because what they say is it's only in later manuscripts and it's been added to the text. That's their claim. 
We only find it in the later manuscripts. We look at the manuscripts. The oldest one we have is in the 5th century. You know, that's in 450 AD. That's because it's been added to the text. Well, here's the thing. Not only can we use the manuscripts, but we can go back. And they, they'll do this as well to try to verify certain things, texts that they would agree with us that should be in the Bible, things that are in the King James Bible. You can go back and you can look at those that are considered the church fathers at that time. And if this, if this verse did not exist prior to the 5th century or 450 AD, then that mean, and it was added at that time, then that means that we shouldn't be able to find a single church father, right? Church father? Quoting it, should we? If it, if, if it wasn't in the Bible, you, you wouldn't be able to find a church father quoting it, right? They, they wouldn't have anything to quote. They couldn't say, hey, this is written here, right? Well, they have a major problem here. And they, 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 of course, they have their arguments. You can look them up after. But one of these, there's no way around it. There, I don't care how many letters you have before your name. I don't care what doctrine you It doesn't mean anything. One of these that I'm getting ready to read to you, there is no way out of the fact that he is quoting 1 John chapter number 5, verse number 7, and specifically the common Yohan. Now, a couple of these guys, you know, it's going to bring back flashbacks from the sermon that I preached about the Orthodox Trinity, right? The first guy is Montanus. Does anybody remember Montanus? Right? Montanism? You know, it's the guy that was like the Pentecostal, basically, and um, he's like Stephen Anderson's forefather. So... <laughs> But Montanus was, was who, uh, Montanism, people will say, was like, he was like, a, he was like a, a modalist guy. That guy, if you read about him, he's a total whack job. This statement right here, you're going to realize that. This, so this is from Montanus, and this Montanus, if you, you guys remember when Tertullian lived? Anybody remember just off the top of your head? What century? <laughs> yeah, it was in the third century. Yeah, it was in like 230 or something like that. That's where a lot of his quotes come from. I believe it was like 220, 230. One, you know, it was like 180 and like 220 you find writings from it. Yeah, it was right around. It was the second century he did. It was the, it was the, the so that's correct. It was second, third century. He overlapped the end of the second century and the beginning of the third century. So Montanus lived right around that same time. Right around that exact same time. Here's a statement from, from Montanus, and this is found in Didymus Day. This is in Latin, of course. Trinitate. This is uh, 341, chapter 3, I guess, maybe verse 41. And this is what he says. I'm just going to read just this one statement from him. I am the Father, the Word, and the Paraclete. So, I mean, you see what a whack job this guy is. But that, right, that verse right there alone. Now, now I'm going to show you one of them where the guy says that he's quoting. But that right there alone, I am the Father, the Word, and the Paraclete. Does anyone know what the Paraclete is? It means the Holy Spirit. It means comforter. So, is there anywhere else in the Bible that you can think of where it, where, it couple, where it couples in tandem all three of those things together outside of 1 John 5, 7. The Father, the Word, and the Paraclete in a statement like that alone. So doesn't that first one at least kind of turn a light bulb on? Like, where is he getting this from? The Father, the Word, and the Paraclete? It's kind of odd, right? Isn't that kind of strange? Okay. Well, that, that came from the end of the second century, the beginning of the third century. So it makes you think, like, what is he talking about? He's obviously referring to, to, he's learned this somewhere, hasn't he? And notice he says the word, specifically there. I am the Father, the Word, and the Paraclete. That's interesting. Right? Um, also here, this is from Cyprian. This right here is the nail in the coffin. Cyprian from De Ecclesia, that means like church, uh, Catholica, Catholicae probably, Unitate. Uh, so the unity of the Catholic Church, the universal church, I guess what that means. It says this, the Lord says, the Father and I are one. So what's that quote? John 1. John 10, 30. Then, it says, then he says this, and again of the Father, the Spirit, and, uh, I'm sorry, and again of the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit, it is written, and these three are one. Did you notice that? He says some there, but he says this. He says, it is written, and these three are one. Anybody got a Bible app on their phone? Yeah, you know, type in, and these three are one. Just type that statement in. Okay. 
Exact. Do it exact. Where did it take you? Multiple places? First John 5. First John 5, 7. Right. The most important thing about this is he says this. And again, of the Father, the, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is written. You know what he's saying? This is a quotation. I'm citing to you. Not only that, he quotes to you, and let me tell you something very particular about 1 John 5, 7. They try to smash out the end of verse 7. This is what occurred to me when I noticed this you know, immediately. They try to take out the end of verse 7 and the, the, and the, uh, the beginning of verse 8, and they want to smash it together. Well, the reason why they have to do that is because the, end, the beginning of, verse, of 1 John 5, 7, the reason why this wouldn't make sense is because the beginning of 1 John 5, 7 is not a complete it's, you know, it's, it's not a complete thought. There are three that testify. It just ends like that. In the NIV, it sounds weird, right? Well, that's why the Bible goes on, the King James Bible, the real Bible, it goes on to say, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And then it tells you, and these three are one. Now, what part of speech is and? You remember? It's a conjunction. It's tying things together. Now, notice what he even quotes there. He doesn't just say, these three are one. He says, and, even the conjunction, telling you that there's something before. Or that. And he's telling you what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now somebody would say, well, why, didn't he, why does he say it is written? And again, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is written, the, and these three are one. This is, this is how, because you, you, know, you know how arguments they could use, right? I'm just playing devil's advocate. They could say, well, this isn't that because he says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you the problem with that. What he quotes here, it says, number one, it is written. So we know that he's quoting Something of scripture, right? That phrase, and these three are one, is only found one place. That's, a, that's our starting point. Number two, and is a conjunction. So it only takes us to 1 John 5, 7. And not only that, it has the conjunction there, so that tells you that there's something prior to that. These three are one. What's the and tying in with? The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Now, the word, I believe, and this is a misunderstanding by many people, is the literal word of God. That's right. And it's not right to say son. But there are even people that you know and that have attacked me that have quoted 1 John 5, 7, and what do they say? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, the reason why they do this is because the word, you know, the Son is the word made flesh. That's not right, but that's the reason why they do that. So, the Son, you could say, is the word... And he is the son both. This Montanus is not quoting scripture when he says the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's incorrect in his understanding of that passage. But he says, and again, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is written. That part's not quoting 1 John 5, 7. The only part that he's quoting 1 John 5, 7 is where he says, it is written, and these three are one. You know what you find out from, from uh, Cyprian? is that he doesn't understand. And you know, Cyprian was a hardcore personage, personage Trinitarian. Do you guys remember Cyprian, where I use quotes from him? Cyprian, his, his backstory, what he believes in everything, he, is a, he was a hardcore Orthodox Trinitarian. So do you know what he believes the word is? He believes it's a person. And who do you hear people making this statement? That 1 John 5, 7 says, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. People that are supporting what? The idea of it being a person. You know why? The Son leans more towards what you would think of as a person, wouldn't it? The Word is the literal Word of God. That's why He transposes these things in His mind. But either way you slice it, first John, this is a direct quote from what these people said. It is written, and these three are one. Those exact words in that exact order is found only in one place in the Bible. And this was quoted in the late, or in the early 3rd century. Late 2nd century is when this man lived. That historical evidence-wise, that's enough. That is case closed. Yep. To say that that did not exist, all I have to do is find one citation. Just one citation. Prior to when you say it didn't exist. You know what happened there? That tells me that in manuscripts that Cyprian had at the end of the 2nd century, the beginning of the 3rd century, that he had access to manuscripts that contained, and these three are one. Right. It's only in 1 John 5, 7, my friend. That's it. You can look all of these quotations up after the sermon if you'd like to go back and review it and validate the things that I said. 
it, as I, I gave you the citation of actually where it, it, it comes from. But notice that this quotation, it begins with a conjunction, so it tells you there's something before that too. Maybe that's why he doesn't try to quote the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And he just says, and again, of the, Son, of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, it is written. These three are one. Here are a couple other ones where it's loosely quoted. Another one says, Cyprian from, uh, this is the, the comma occurs in Epistola of Jubinium. If anyone could be baptized among the heretics, then he could obtain remission of sins. If he obtained the remission of sins, he was sanctified. And if he was sanctified, he was made the temple of God. But of what God, I ask? The creator? Excuse me. Impossible. He did not believe in him. Christ? But he could not be made Christ's temple, for he denied the deity of Christ. The Holy Spirit? Since, since the three are one, what pleasure could the Holy Spirit take in the enemy of the Father and the Son? Notice. Since, since the three are one. It's only found in one place. Wait, it, it talks about I and the Father are one. But that, over and over again, you see this come up, the three are one. Tertullian in AD 215, a little, this is a little over a half a century before Sinai Atticus and Vaticanus. This is actually from it versus Praxis, Praxis uh, that I read uh, quotations from uh, during with the other sermon I cited earlier. It says this, And so the connection of the Father and the Son and of the Paraclete, that's the Holy Spirit, makes three coherent entities, one coherent from the other, which three are one entities, preaching serious uh, heresy right here, refers to the unity of their substance, not the oneness of their, not the oneness of their number. So some serious heresy going on there. And then uh, Priscillacan, AD 380. This is within 50 years or so of, of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. That's within, this is within 50 years or so. This is Liber, a Liber, I guess it would be. It's, it's, it's Latin, so it would be an uh, E sound. Liber Apologeticus. As John says, and there are three which give testimony on earth, the, word, the water, the flesh, and the blood, and these three are in one. And there are three which give testimony in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Spirit, and these three are one in Christ Jesus. Notice what he kind of added there, too. That's a number. This is also, I, I actually must not have, while doing preparation, didn't pay enough attention to this particular citation. But that right there is just as pow powerful or more powerful than the powerful than the first. This is from 380. So this is within 50 years or so of Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, but it's after. So that's, that's one of the things that isn't as appealing of it. But it says that there are three which give testimony in heaven. That's like witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Spirit, it says, and these three are one in Christ Jesus. So this is actually a contemporary, you know, a contemporary with Sinaiticus and Vaticanus. So let me say this. It didn't matter historical evidence to me. That, that, made, that made no difference to me at all. I want you to go to Deuteronomy chapter number 8. The historical evidence doesn't shake my faith. When they try to cite things where they're supposedly proving that it should be in the Bible, that doesn't bother me. Because I believe God's word no matter what. Amen. I believe God's word because I believe the preservation of God's word. I believe the doctrine of preservation. That just right. proves when these people start saying, well, you know, when they, they claim that they believe the Bible. But then they go to the Bible and say that these things shouldn't be in here. That just shows that their presupposition isn't true. That they don't really believe the Bible when they go to the Bible in the first place. Why? Because the Bible itself tells you that it's God says in the Bible that it will be here forever, that he will preserve it. So it just shows you, these people like James White, all of them, they don't really truly believe the Bible. If they did, they would be able to look at Matthew 4.4 4 and what we're going to read here in Deuteronomy 8.3, and they would be able to look you in the face and tell you, I believe that I have every word of God. Every word of God. God promised to preserve his word. We should be able to get our hands on every single word. Every word. Look at Deuteronomy 8.3. We'll end here. It says, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna which thou knewest not. Speaking unto the Israelites. This is what he's telling the Israelites. Put, you, put yourself in their shoes. And this is what it says. Neither did thy fathers know that he might make thee know. That man doth not live but by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. What other, what other conclusion can you deduce from that than 
Every single word is important. Mm -hmm. right. Every word. Yeah. I don't care if somebody's not removing the whole verse. Every word matters, my friend. Amen. If somebody tries to tell you, hey, 1 John 5, 7, it's not that big of a deal. Take them to Matthew 4, 4. Mm -hmm. Take them to Deuteronomy 8, 3. And say, hey, man, I want every word. Amen. Every word matters. When you look at the Bible, you know what the strongest proof is? The strongest proof is comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. When you read that cross reference, you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, that should cause your heart to burn within you. And you should be able to see, like, man, this is powerful. This is a great, deep, deep truth that you can find here in the Bible. So what do we hang our hat on? Historical evidence? No, but it's there. I can point to strong historical evidence that, that, that suggests that this was in the text, that all of these men had Cyprian, Montanus making statement. All of these men are just not connected to each other, but they're conveniently just quoting verbatim, you know, 1 John 5, 7, and even saying it is written. That's not what I hang my hat on, though. You know what I hang my hat on? The promises of God. Amen. I hang my hat on Psalm 12, verse 6, 6 and 7. I hang my hat on Isaiah 59. That's what I hang my hat on. I hang my hat on the Lord in the flesh, right. telling me. Thousands of years after Deuteronomy 8, 3, he still quotes the same passage. You know what he still had? He still had that word every in there. Think about that. He still had that word. You know what he said? you got to live by every word of God. Every word matters. All of 1 John 5, 7 matter. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for your word for your word. We thank you so much that you preserved it.